need a recordings in progress. I better be careful what I say now. <laughs> uh, we would need a whole course, a university course to do justice to group dynamics. But I thought that what I would try to do, attempt to do with you today would be to take some basic principles and look at them as applied to spirituality of the heart, spirituality of our three congregations, of our, the four branches of our Chevalier family. I'm not sure if there are any um, members of the lay, lay members of the Chevalier family here with us today. No, not on this program. No, not yet, anyhow. But uh, there are daughters and MSC sisters here, as well as MSC um, men, brothers and priests. So welcome to you all. Um, I'm, I'm going to be shifting in and out of my PowerPoint at different times. Um, and I hope also that we can break into group and groups and do some group work because this is a session on group dynamics. Uh, so it would make sense that we have some time in groups and that we are exploring the nature of groups from within a group. So Ben is going to put us into breakout groups randomly. Um, unless you're in a community already, and I understand that if you're sitting there in a group, you'll just work together in your group. But the rest of us, it will be a bit of pot luck who we end up with. But the purpose of being in the group is to explore group dynamics together, to be watching, alert, aware of what it's like for me to be in a group, to do that kind of reflection that's needed to do the learning um, about group work. So I'm going to begin by sharing my screen. Hopefully, yeah. to bring you into the side of this so I can see you. Can you see the screen? Yes. You can. Yeah. Well, those of you who are in Africa might recognize this image, um, but I, in my conversations with my own confreres, they haven't always recognized it. So I, I'm not sure if you'll know it or not. It's a Congolese man, a young man, and he is passing through rites of initiation. And one of the, one of the characteristics of the rites of initiation in this particular tribe of men is that they would cover their bodies in white clay and it would be a sign of a whole renewal process going on within them that enables them to move from being a separate child under the care of his mother to becoming a, a member of, of the group, of the group of, of men within his community. So often, in our lives, there are these moments of these threshold moments where we are at the point of becoming somebody new. And that by its very nature is about um, stepping into larger and larger groups. <laughs> Some of you who are here, I see on the screen, I have been or are in leadership. That whole process is a process of initiation where you are initiated into a larger group. More responsibility, more engagement, more connection. 
So when we're talking about uh, renewal, I think one of the things we have to be aware is that renewal, we can experience renewal as a kind of a personal renewal, yes. But renewal is always asking us to be bigger. And part of being invited into our own bigness to be bigger people, to be people with a broader mind, a bigger heart, is that we become more and more engaged in the world. For us in our life in Christ, that especially means being immersed in the world of the poor, the world of the little ones, the world of those who are marginalised. And each of us has experience of being immersed more and more deeply in the lives of others. So part of the very nature of a renewal program <clears throat> is that it has to do with groups and it has to do with group dynamics. It's not just a, some kind of personal little uh, experience that, that no one else knows about or, or can engage with. It, it, it will take you out into something much bigger than yourself, and that means into the lives of other people. There are very intimate and personal experiences with the Lord, with, with our God, with the spirit of our God, but they're for a bigger purpose than just my own, my own growth, my own... Um, my own gain, I should say. So I thought I would start with this image because for me it evokes um, the, the need to uh, recognize that there are rites of passage that are an important part of group dynamics. And uh, each one of us knows something about that because if you're an MSC sister or you're a daughter of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart, if you're a member of the lay family or an MSC priest or brother, we have all passed through rites of passage in order to belong to these groups. These are group dynamics within our own, within our own lives, within our own congregational experience. And there are many others other than the experience of profession. To move. There we are. I'd like to begin with a song. So uh, hopefully, you, if you want to sing along with this song, you can, but I'd suggest that your microphone be on mute because if we're all singing at the same time on Zoom, we sound like a group of cats rather than a <laughs> choir. So <laughs> rather than... Uh, squealing like cats let's perhaps sing this song with our hearts open to god but muted <laughs>
Take a few moments of silence just to listen in our own hearts to how the words of that song are speaking to us, particularly in the context of this, this um, seminar, this webinar that is focused on, on group on group dynamics. What is the sense of what God, God might be saying to you? What word or phrase stands out for you? And if a word or a phrase stands out for you, I would invite you to go to the chat box at the, in the menu on the screen and to type into the chat to everyone, whatever it is, that word, that phrase that, that is there for you so that we can all share the word or phrase that has spoken to you. And as we see the words that are coming in from people around the world, just read some of them. If you love, then you will know the Lord. Gifts given to share, gifts share, gifts given to be shared. We are all one body. Seek the greatest gift of all. Let us be your love. We were given to share. The gifts we have were given to share. Love, share our one, our hope. Gifts given to be shared, one body. We are one. We are called to share the gifts of good. We are all one body. And so we can see some common words, common themes surfacing. 
that are speaking to our hearts as we begin this time together in a prayerful listening way. And so it is when we come to looking at groups, we are talking about not just an individual reality, but the way in which people interact and share their gifts as one. So some very significant parts of group dynamics have to do with this process of sharing, this process of coming from a higher gift. Um, and some of you have named that as love. Some of you have named that as hope. Perhaps service. So let us move on from this. So thank you to all of you who have put something into the chat box. I can move this on. This is a quotation from Jules Chevalier, as you can see. And uh, one that we all know fairly well, I would imagine. He said back in 1900, the word coming from the heart of his father made the world emerge from nothing. And from the heart of the incarnate word pierced on Calvary, I see a new world emerging the world of those he has chosen, and this creation, so fertile and full of grandeur and inspired by love and mercy, is the church, the mystical body of Christ, which makes this new creation present on earth until the end of time. Chevalier had a very strong sense that the heart of Christ was uh, not just um, an individual devotion, not just a personal experience. It certainly is that, but that it's much more than that. And that the heart of Christ is the place out of which the church itself flows the church being a group, of course. And he, he spells out that, that this is not just a physical reality. This is a mystical reality. And when we're talking about groups, we have to, particularly in our context, our context as Christians, but as people of the heart, of the family of the heart, that what we're talking about is something that's more than just the physical group, more than the physical group. It has a mystical dimension. It has, a, it has a metaphysical dimension. And this is good for us to open our minds to the reality that group dynamics is not just about the physical interactions in a group, but it's much more than that. And one of the things we will do is explore a bit this morning towards the latter part of the um, the this session, I shouldn't say morning, it's only morning for me, uh, the, that we would be looking at systems and, and how systems operate. They are much bigger than just the physical gathering of individuals. So this is, uh, we are exploring something not just about groups, but about what emerges and this is certainly the nature of, God, of, of groups that they emerge and often they seem to emerge out of nothing, but they emerge out of an inspiration, out of a, a mystical reality, of something bigger than the people themselves. So we could start by just saying, well, when we're talking about group dynamics, what are we talking about? A collection, a group. What is a group? A group is a collection of two or more people who meet regularly and influence one another over a period of time. 
they perceive themselves as distinct and distinguishable from others. They share common values and they strive for common objectives. All groups have this in common. If you were to reflect for a moment on the groups that you belong to, you would be able to say that the groups you belong to have an identity. There is a group identity. It's not just the identity of the individuals together. It's more than that. There are always common values that form a group and that distinguish groups from other groups. And there is a purpose, an objective for this reality, this group that has formed. Group dynamics is the study of groups um, and the study of the processes that take place within groups, between groups, interpersonal relationships um, and intergroup relationships, intra-group relationships. Group dynamics um, was first explored by um, a man called Kurt Lewin right back in the late 1800s. He went on to do an enormous amount of study in group dynamics and eventually um, after he had escaped Germany during the war and come to the United States, he established um, an organization that developed what many people know now as T groups. Uh, T groups or training groups was about helping people to become aware of the group dynamics that take place within groups so that they could be, uh, so that those groups could learn to be more fruitful, more productive, more positive in their outcomes, that they would be more conscious of the values that they shared and more focused on their common objectives for the purpose of uh, that group achieving its aims. In group dynamics, the phrase group process refers to the understanding of the behaviours of people in groups, such as groups such as task groups or other types of groups that are trying to solve a problem or make a decision. Uh, as we will explore a little bit later, the the dynamic of problem solving is one, uh, one particular, one, one way of groups dealing with issues. Uh, there is a strong movement away from problem solving um, in groups in our time towards um, considering matters not as problems, but as emerging realities that offer us opportunities. So, so the group dynamic focus on sub, pro, uh, problem solving, um, I was going to say so, sovereign problem, but I, it's early morning, so that's okay, I excuse myself. Uh, but problem solving is um, seen these days as less productive, because the focus is on negative realities rather than on positive opportunities. So there's a, there are definite shifts in group dynamics that are a part of contemporary thinking. So we keep that in mind. An individual with expertise in group process, such as a trained facilitator, can assist a group in accomplishing its objective by diagnosing how well the group is functioning as a, as a problem solving or um, opportunity seeking decision making entity and intervening to alter the group operational behavior. And it's not unusual, and I would be fairly sure that many of you have experienced in groups that you're a part of 
the work of people like moderators or facilitators or uh, animators. They get called different things in different language traditions. Um, I know in Latin America, the terminology tends to be animation rather than facilitation. But I know that in Australia, for example, there are groups of people coming together for spiritual direction. And they have a spiritual director who works with the group, group spiritual direction. And then in ministry, ministry groups, you may have uh, ministry supervisors who help you to supervise your ministry collectively in order to work together as a team more strongly to build greater um, outcomes. So group dynamics today is, is there's, it's a whole science really. And there are many, many people who are available to help us work through group dynamics. I'm very privileged at the moment myself to be working with the daughters of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart to be facilitating their coming general uh, chapter. And the chapter is a group. And what we want to do is we want that chapter to be the most fruitful chapter it can be. So we look at the group dynamics together and we try to find what dynamics are going to aid us to work together in a really fruitful way to achieve the objectives and aims of the congregation, because the general chapter is about the congregation. So as you can, as, as I hope you can see as I'm talking, as, as I'm exploring this with you, that Group dynamics is very practical. There are theories of group dynamics, but the application of it is very practical. You can apply group dynamics, group processes to communities, local communities, provinces, congregations, ministry groups, any group that you're a part of, family, family. Wow, the group dynamics that are a part of your family. That's, that's a story in itself. Yeah, A rich tapestry to explore. There are different types of groups, as I'm saying. There are formal groups, uh, like the congregation you belong to. There are informal groups. Um, today, we are an informal group. The only reason that we're all here together is that we received the invitation to be a part of this renewal program. We possibly thought, ah, group dynamics, that sounds interesting. Uh, I might sit, on, sit in on that webinar. Uh, and we have inadvertently, without necessarily planning it, formed a group. And then later, Ben will put us into some breakout groups, as they're called on Zoom, um, online virtual groups for us to, to, to do some talking around group dynamics. And this will be the formation of some informal groups. There are groups called command groups and task groups. Command groups are groups that are formed for the purpose of executive um, operations. So you might have a leadership team, congregational leadership team, provincial council. Um, these are command groups. They're, they're uh, if you'll excuse the language, it's not there that they're not there to give you commands. <laughs> that would be it to misunderstand the, the reason. Um, they're, they're executive groups. Their role is to perform functions to enable a formal group to, to operate well by um, giving it um, the kind of assistance it needs to, to function according to its uh, directives. Task groups have specific tasks to perform. 
um, we are having some work done in the garden here at the general house at the moment. Um, and uh, there was some damage to, to something and, and it's being renewed. And the people who are working there, the builders, uh, they are performing a task. They are a group, very much a group. They work very well together. And their task is to rebuild. Then there are informal groups like interest groups. You could belong, perhaps you belong to uh, an interest group like uh, Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation, uh, where you have a group of people who are focused on solidarity for Sudan, or you are focused on um, supporting refugees in Ukraine or Syria or Yemen, or you might belong to an interest group that is about um, women in the world today. Um, this week we celebrated International Women's Day. And there are numerous in interest groups based on, on the role of women today. What does an interest group do? It doesn't necessarily do any task. It comes together for the purpose of sharing the common interest. And then there are friendship groups where people come together because of other relationship connections they have. I belong to a task group in Australia, which is the association of uh, psychotherapists that I belong to. But we also have a number of interest groups. Um, I belong to one which spends time looking at um, different processes that are used to help groups develop their, their thinking. Um, but we also have friendship groups because I did my training with a number of those people and we have stayed together and we keep in regular contact as a group. So there are different types of groups as I'm sure you're aware. In group dynamics, there are uh, different processes that we might just name. There are the continuous processes of, of growth, of exploration, of task-oriented projects that, that we are involved in. Uh, but some of those processes, continual processes, operate at a personal level, while others of them are group processes that we may or may not be aware of. For example, um, we may be aware that in our province as a group, we have an ongoing commitment to processing in ongoing formation, in religious uh, spiritual development of the group, of developing our charism, of developing our mission and ministry. But equally, we're aware that we all have a call to be in spiritual direction or supervision. And that might be continuing to go on. At the unconscious level, well, I'm sure you know as well as I do that whoever I invented the idea of community um, was a bit of a joker because community would be one of the most challenging experiences, I think, of group. Often we don't get to choose what group we're in. We end up with a group of people. Sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it's incredibly challenging. But constantly we are being invited to grow, to grow individually and grow together. And we may not even see that happening. That may be hidden from us, but it's there nevertheless happening. Then going to the top, we have a whole lot of dynamics that are associated with our groups. Uh, anyone in leadership realises that you may be a leadership team, but then there are all these associated things that you have to be aware of that you're, you're involved in. So you will also, in the groups you're in, have dynamics that you're associated with. A really important part of group dynamics is change. And we will talk more about change today because 
groups come together for an objective. But in order to reach objectives, um, the group must change. Groups must develop in order to reach their objectives. They must move beyond the individual level to the collective level. And this is the beauty of community life, of communal life, is that it demands change. And we will see when we talk about spirituality of the heart, that this is a necessary reality in the group dynamics that, that flow out of heart spirituality change <clears throat> then we move to rigidity and flexibility so one of the things that's incredibly important in group dynamics is whether the group is an open group or a closed group groups that have very closed boundaries tend to be very rigid they don't change they don't grow and they tend to have very static, very um, limited dynamics within the group. Uh, in a sense, they recording tend to be- Recording in progress. Very... What was that? Oh, it's recording in progress. progress. Okay, thank you. And uh, the uh, closed systems, closed groups, um, are not only limiting for the individuals involved in them, they tend to be fairly fruitless. They don't tend to produce a lot of nourishment for the world, um, for others. A lot of nourishment. Can I ask you, if you've got your microphone on, could you mute it, please, even if you're in a group? Because we get feedback and that becomes difficult for everyone to hear. So recording in sitting, progress. If you're sitting in front of the screen. Can you please turn off you your microphone? Can you please turn off your microphone? Uh, there, are, there are a number of people who have their microphone on. And particularly if you're in a community, can you please turn them off because we're getting feedback. Okay, thank you. That's good. Uh, if you could just leave your microphone off until I invite you to put it on, because when we do want to get feedback from you, we'll invite you to unmute your microphone at that time. But it's really important if you can leave it off during the presentation, otherwise it becomes very distracting for everyone. Thank you. So um, this is actually a very important part of group dynamics is rigidity and flexibility because an open group is a very fruitful group. And we will explore something about that as we, we continue on about um, the group membranes and um, how, how, how open and closed systems work. Group organisation, well, yeah, look, we all know that groups, whether they are formal groups or informal groups, there is a level of organisation that takes place within a group. It could be a very informal organisation, but there has to be some organisation. <laughs> I remember a friend of mine in Australia working with a group of women and she was asked to lead them in a process of, uh, of finding a way to work as a group, but not to have anyone in charge of the group. And it was really quite alarming because every time the group came together, they would all sit there waiting for someone to say something, but no one wanted to say anything because no one wanted to be the leader. So you, you have to have, or by, by their very nature, groups have to have some organisation. It, it doesn't have to be rigid. It could be very free-flowing, but organisation is an essential part of group dynamics. Okay, so these are some of the group dynamics that we will explore. I'd like you to do some reflection, please. And this is the question I'm asking you. 
What makes for a good group? And this is what I'd like you to reflect on. Remember any context in which you have lived or worked and recall what you have seen in that group that made it a good group to be in. And what did not make it a good group to be in? So this is the question. Remember any context in which you've lived or worked, it might have been you're working in, uh, in hospital care or nursing or teaching or in parish ministry or leadership or just community life at home, maybe one community that you lived in, in in Manado, or maybe you lived in a community in, uh, in uh, Cebu, or um, in Hatsa Park, in uh, Barrel, or wherever it was. Whatever the context is, just choose one. And it's a context where you were in that you, were, you could see the group and what made it a good group? What made it a good group? And can you take 10 minutes of your own time now, just in silence, reflecting on this question? What made it a good group? And what, what about that group made it sometimes maybe not so good? And write these down. Just write it down. I hope you've brought a, something to write with, something to record your thoughts and reflections with. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. And after the 10 minutes, I'm going to ask Ben, Ben, if you would then in, take people into breakout groups and if you would, um, in those breakout groups, if you would share your responses to this question, you would share with each other your responses to this question. What makes for a good group? You don't have to put a lot of detail, but some points. That's all, just some points. And when we come back from the larger group, from the breakout group, sorry, in the larger group together, here, we will just share some of those on, on, uh, on screen together. So the three steps, what makes for a good group, some personal reflection, just 10 minutes to do that. Then the breakout groups will be for 15 minutes. And then we're gonna take five minutes for some feedback here, okay? Just if you're understanding what I'm saying and it's okay with you, I just need some indication. And one of the ways to do that is if you could just do this, I know that you've heard me and you understand. Okay, looks to me like those who are on screen understand. I, I hope all those who are not on screen haven't gone off and gone to bed or something. But if, you, if we could do that. So 10 minutes now, um, for me, that would make it um, almost half past uh, seven in the morning. <laughs> and for those of you, you can choose your own time zone. And then Ben, you there, Ben? Where are you? There. Yep. Yeah. Ben, yes, we'll yes, put I'm you here. in break. Thanks, Ben. Yep. And Ben will put you automatically into breakout groups in 10 minutes. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. The breakout session is uh, 15 In, or 10 minutes. Just the breakout group session will be 15 minutes. Okay, got it. Yeah, and, and we go there in 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you.
Recording in progress. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Nice to see you all again. Is everyone back? Yes, Friday, we are here. Yeah. Friday, we are already. Good. Thank you, Ben, for doing that. And uh, we're all back here now. So remember our question, what makes for a good group? So I'm just going to, uh, to stop screen sharing and bring back the, everyone on screen. Oh, hang on. You've stopped sharing and I need to find a way to do that. There we are. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Go back to full screen. Okay. We're back on screen now and um, welcome back to you all. What I would like to do is to take the opportunity just to hear from some of you. Not everyone needs to share, but what I would like you to share is, is, uh, what would be the five most important things that came up in your sharing that make for a good group? If you had to prioritize, what were the five most significant things that make for a good group? What would you say? What did your group say? And I'm uh, just going to write some down as we go. So if you want to share, can you do this? Can you put your hand up like this so I can see you? Because sometimes I miss the little icon on the screen. <laughs> if you can put your hands up if you want to share, and then I'll invite you to speak and turn off your mic, your mute, and, and come on. So I see Aaron, Aaron had his hand up. Was that Aaron or was that a joke, Aaron? I, no, no, I was just... Like last time you said to get, 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 <laughs> get in connection with that. <laughs> Good on you. From our All group, right. we asked our sister, uh, sister Helen, we, I asked, we, we decided from our sister Helen, we'll share oh, from our group. Sister Helen, okay, Sister Helen, can you Almost. turn on your microphone? And... Oh, oh there you are. Am, am I on? Welcome. You are, yes, Helen, yes. yeah, welcome. Well, Father Chris, I arrived just as you were saying, now the three points are. So I missed oh, yeah. the whole lot of the first part, oh, but okay. I was very happy to, um, to to be in the group. They were very, very good companions. So the ones that came up for us, I've got the three here that we consider to be the most important, was communicating and dialogue. Mm -hmm. Yes. And regular comings together so that... Um, uh, thoughts and ideas and plans and things can be expressed and talked about. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, there was a third one? A collective decision-making. Or shared de decision-making. Okay, good. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Helen, and thank you to your group. What about another person or group? Doesn't matter. Yes, uh, Jess? Jesse, would you like to turn your microphone on, Jess? Thank you. Um, the first is um, those who come together in a group must be there willingly. It's very important that they 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 are there uh, on their own accord. There is they they have the motivation to be there. Yes. And then the next one is respect. They must be respect for each other, and nobody is yes. trying to be. Dom dominating so respect and yes. there must be uh, a leveling of uh, those who are there must be leveling off because they come from different places different background maybe they have different uh, uh, purpose there must mm. be some leveling off and then the the fourth one is to be give give it time no i mean you cannot expect perfect perfect uh, organization immediately <coughs> I mean, there will be some uh, differences, there are problems, difficulties. Give yourself time. Don't do not be too hard. First, observe. No, observe what uh, what they are doing, what their capabilities, what they are willing to do. So okay. everybody should learn to give time. And the last one is to give it a mystical dimension. He said, when when we we organize, no, when we when we plan, no. 
I have a candle uh, lighted at the back to make to remind us that we cannot do it alone. We need the Holy Spirit. So that's the, those are the, the five ones. But I added only that, sister, make sure you, you don't turn off. Uh, you, you turn off the candle because it's fire prevention month now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, thanks. Thank you for the tips also on fire prevention, Jess. That was great. Um, Jess, I, you said, um, you said le leveling off. And yes. can you just explain what you mean by leveling off? Is that like everyone is equal or what did, no, what did you no, mean by it? It's more that we understand each other. I mean, when we come together, surely we have differences. We, we need not be uh, the same, but we just understand what are the differences, where each other, each one is coming from. Okay. So it's kind of understanding of each other. Jess and those in your group, thank you so much for, for that. Would, would, a, would a third group like to, to share? Um, yes, yeah, Sister, Sister Lovis, lovely to see you again. Would you like to turn on your microphone, please? Sister Lovis was doing a, uh, one of these courses with me in Philippines, so it was lovely to see you again. Thank you, Father Chris. Nice to see you too. Mm -mm. In our group, we were four, but our the, the fourth member could not. She was not able to be with us. Maybe connection problem. But the three of us, we shared that one thing that it, that makes the the group good is listening. Listening, when, thank you. Yes, listening. Yep. Also confidentiality. Confidentiality. Yes. Punctuality also. Punctuality is also one thing that makes the group yes. move Punctual. on. Because you start on time, you finish on time, you go back to your, your, your work, whatever you do. And then the attitude, what makes the group not so good is the attitude of knowing it all. No? Oh, no. If I think I know everything and others yeah. not so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's all I can share. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rose. From our group. Mm. Yeah, lovely. Um, and and I'm hearing punctuality, and I'm thinking you're probably thinking of a very specific kind of group, like a task or a command group. But yeah. like in, imagine this in an informal group that comes together to have a, a relaxed time together um, to enjoy um, wine and cheese and a movie. Punctuality probably wouldn't be so important. Yes, that, that yeah. one is, it, it, we cannot uh, really count on punctuality on that kind of group. Group, yeah, so it yeah. depends on the group a bit, but you've named some lovely things there, thank you. And also for naming what doesn't make for good groups is when we know it all. Mm -mm. Yeah, so yeah. thank you for that. And we'll just take one more group. Is there one more group that would like to, 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 to share? Yes, we've got Ultra Mint. Ultra Mint S1. Thank you. Sister Ultra Mint. <laughs> thank you, Father. I'm Sister Evelyn. Sister Evelyn. Thank you, Sister Evelyn. Yes. Whereabouts? Um, I don't know if we are many of us, but we, we had only two in the sharing group. Yeah. But um, we, we managed to do the sharing with only the two of us okay. present. Yeah, and you. we have some, some points which have already been mentioned by the other groups, but I'll just yeah. have to go through what we have that make a group a good group. Yeah. And the first thing that we talked about is listening to one another. Listening is one thing that we shared around the, the idea. And also collaboration. Mm -hmm. And when we work together, we 
We also have shared responsibilities or teamwork. It also makes a group moves on. And yep. the other thing that we shared around is when we give all members or members equal space and time to help each one, you know, take care of themselves as well in order for them to do their job well mm -hmm. in whatever ministries they are in. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you, Sister Evelyn. Whereabouts, whereabouts are you at the moment? What country are you in? I am an MSC sister from Papua New Guinea. Oh, lovely. Hello to all the MSC sisters in Papua New Guinea. Good, yes. good that you've got connection. PNG is usually very difficult to get connection. So thank you. Thank yes, you for thank you, thoughts. Father. Sister Ultramint. <laughs> <laughs> So we go to uh, back to the group. Uh, so what we've been listening to, if we just listen to the one things that we've heard, communicating, and, and as I'm saying them, just be stopping and thinking, yes, I agree with that. I think that's a priority for good group making. Communicating and dialogue. Regular coming together. Collective shared decision-making willingness to be there willingly to be there for the right motivation respect for each other leveling off as jess explained it which is about understanding each other having some level of understanding giving it time that actually came up twice giving space and time giving it time having a reminder of the holy spirit there like a candle the, met, the mystical dimension, listening, confidentiality, punctuality, collaboration, teamwork. And, and there was one mention of that when, when we know it all, it doesn't help us. <laughs> yeah. So it's good. We could look at that actually and say that the positive of that is when we don't know it all, that's a good thing, yeah? That, that having that kind of openness and space where we're willing to learn, willing to discover is a good thing, yeah? So thank you for all of those. And you've, what you've done is you've given me a list of some of the key values that are part of forming a group. And we call them core values. And I'd like to go back to my PowerPoint at this point. Core values are at the heart, good core values are at the heart of all groups that function well. My current slide. So when I did this exercise recently with another group, we created what's called a word cloud. And you've probably seen these things before. We put all of the words into a computer program and it generated this image. And we could in fact do that with the list you just gave me. We could generate a list of words that would say, spell out what's, what are the priorities. In a word cloud, the bigger the word is, the more often it was mentioned. So some of the really important words around good group building are it's other-centered. That was the biggest word that came up in the times I've done this with people, that it's about others, it's not about the group. Yeah? Or in the group, it's about the others, not about me. Empathy and listening and encouragement were all key words, key core values that were mentioned. Friendship, communication, integrity, members of the group, humility, self-knowledge, simplicity. These are all key aspects. And then there are many other smaller words in there that might have been mentioned once or twice. Um, openness, depth mutuality, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're doing is we're saying that 
Good groups have some very clear core values. And core values shape uh, the functioning of groups. Let's look at something around core values. Strong core values give a shared sense of commitment of allowing us to unite together. Core values are about collective behaviours. They're not just about individual behaviours, but, but they include individual behaviours. Shared core values are a powerful reminder that no one person can achieve everything on their own. In this way, core values foster connection and trust between uh, those who have responsibility in the, in the, in the group, so those um, who are in the organisational system of the group and the members of the group themselves. So you, if you look at this from the point of view of congregational life, because uh, we're all in congregational groups, if we all are holding the core values in a way uh, that, that gives them um, focus and emphasis, and we've had a chance to share together the core values, and we've heard each other and prioritised what are our core values, it's then that we can be much more focused in our mission, in our ministry, much more, we can give our energy to it much better. Um, people feel like they belong and there is a greater trust that grows between leadership and membership. This is really important. And one of the big failures in religious life is that we do not take the time to um, highlight, to prioritise our core values. It's, what, it's actually one of the main purposes of a chapter, chapters at the general level and provincial level, even significant community meetings can all be times for re, renaming again our charism, our guiding light, our inspiration, and that highlights our core values because that's what our core values are um, uh, as... Uh, Daughters and sons of Jill Chevalier, Father Lincoln's um, mother, Hatsa. We learn from them a set of core values from the heart of Christ. We, we learn a set of core values and we have to keep reiterating those again and again and redefining what they mean in the new context. By embracing core values, we can overcome difficult situations and achieve positive results. It's important to live your core values, not just talk about them. So in good group dynamics, we name them, we prioritize them, but then we talk about, well, how do we implement them? How do we live them? And when we talk about implementing core values in group dynamics, we have to talk about what's real and concrete and possible rather than just talking in a visionary way. Because if things are not concretized or um, we could say incarnate, if they're not lived in bodies, um, if it's not about, if I can say, may the sacred heart of Jesus be everywhere loved, but if I don't go out and shake my neighbor's hand, it's meaningless. It's a dead core value. Core values come alive in action. So when recognising one another for demonstrating core values, for acting on them, those values become more tangible. So if I was to say to Jess, look, Jess, I really admire the way that you help us to understand each other. What I do is I start helping him and, the, and my group recognise that this value is important to us as a group. It affirms it, it encourages it. 
Recognizing, recognition always allows you to highlight core values in terms of real and everyday behaviors, not just aspirational statements. I think we sometimes call them uh, grandfather statements or grandmother statements. They're nice statements, but in terms of uh, tangible everyday behaviors, they, they don't actually connect. So in core values to do with groups and group, the group dynamics, we're talking about teams, we're talking about relationships, we're talking about leadership. In what ways can we develop these values in the groups which we belong to? So that's another question for reflection. I'm not, it's a question for your reflection. Yeah, we're not going to spend time on it now, but, but it is important that you continue to reflect on what are the ways in which we can develop these values in the group, having named them, that we belong to. One of the things that we could say is the group that we have online today is a, a microcosm of our, our congregations where... Uh, where um, a small set, a small group of a larger reality, which we call MSC, MSC Sisters, Daughters of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart. So we are already naming the kind of values that belong to our congregations, our spirituality, our charism. In what ways can we develop those values, those dynamics in the groups we belong to? This text is from Brian Gallagher, former Australian provincial of the Australian province. So he wrote a book called uh, Communal Wisdom, A Way of Discerning for a Pilgrim Church. Um, it's an excellent book. I would encourage you to get a copy of it. Um, it's published by uh, uh, um, 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 Coventry Press in Australia. And um, he sets out, it's not a big book, it's very simple and easy to read, but he sets out very beautifully how we can, how we can discern as, uh, as a group, as groups, how we do group discernment. And this is something that he says. My experience of working with groups has convinced me that a group is more than the summation of many individuals. This is really important. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And some of the values that you highlighted were also speaking to this. There is a dimension to groups, particularly groups with a religious core value system like ours, where we recognize that if we have 30 people coming together and they're all sharing, that what happens is that there is another voice there as well. And that voice is a voice which is a collective voice. So there are the voices of all the individuals and you could say, yes, we have 30 different voices here, but there is also the collective voice. And groups that work well together listen for that voice. They don't just listen to each individual, but they also listen to the voice of the communal, of the, of the community, uh, the collective voice. And in discernment, in group discernment, what we might do is that we might invite individuals to share. But as they share, we might then say, and what is the group saying? We might ask, what is the group saying? And, and we might hear something like, well, you know, we heard the group saying something that holds all of the individual sayings. It may not be the same words. It might be openness. It might be 
vision, but it's something much bigger than just the sum of its parts. In group, in group dynamics, this is very important. And in the work of one particular um, man who has done a lot of work on group dynamics, a man by the name of Otto Sharma. Some of you might be familiar with Otto Sharma. He works from, the, from MIT in the United States, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he, he works with a system called Theory U and in working with it, he helps us to recognize that we haven't truly listened until we have heard the voice of the source. And the source is the whole, the voice underneath the individuals. So we need, if we're going to, if, if we're going to use group dynamics well and fruitfully, we need to be listening for that deeper voice, the what he calls source. And I think in our spirituality, what we call it is the heart of Christ. That we listen, not just individually as a group of people, but we listen in the heart of Christ. And we're listening to the heart of Christ in one another, through one another, beyond one another a collective voice in that. Brian goes on to say, when a group or communal discernment is sought, it seems critical to acknowledge that there is a group experience of God's spirit and spirits not of God. There's a group experience of this. Are we listening to the group or are we just listening to ourselves? There is a group identity. One of, the, one of the failures in group work of facilitating group work is that the group doesn't name its identity when it starts. Now, that doesn't mean if there was a group of MSC meeting together in uh, Manila, that doesn't mean that they have to say before they begin, uh, we're a group of MSC. <laughs> That's not what I mean. What I mean is, what are the core values? The identity is, is, is named when you start naming the core values. So if I was working with a group in Manila, I would begin by saying, tell me what's important to you as a group. And I would ask them individually to share, but then to tell me what's, what's the group, what's important to the group. And they would name that. And they, what they'd be doing is naming their identity. When a group knows its identity, it knows how to move forward with its mission. But if the group is not clear on its identity, its tasks and its operational systems become very confused. This is really important. Thirdly, the thing here that Brian names is group vulnerability. Unfortunately, in groups, when we come together, often what we do is scapegoating. So something's not working in the group. What do we do? We blame somebody in the group. Well, we didn't get very far in that conversation because, you know, Father, Father, um, Father Joshua, I don't know if you're trying to think of a name that no one knows, <laughs> Father Jacob, well, he, he messed up the process. He didn't share properly, yeah? But actually, it's not Father Jacob's problem. It's the group vulnerability that is being identified here. And when the group can name its, its vulnerability, its group vulnerability, it, it provides opportunities for growth. So if you're in a local community and you're, you're doing communal sharing with one another, which is a wonderful thing to do in, in local communities, it's really important to name the 
the vulnerability of the group. What do we mean, vulnerability of the group? Where is the weak spots? Where are the blind spots of the group? If I think about some groups that I have worked in over my life, and at one stage for a couple of years, I was uh, um, looking after a school in Fiji. I recognise that for us as a group who were running the school, the group vulnerability was that we didn't communicate very well with each other. And it was a real weakness. And we communicated what we thought was necessary, but we didn't communicate what was personal. We didn't communicate what was visionary. We didn't communicate things like uh, uh, our, our core values. So that lack of communication was a real vulnerability. In the list of core values that you shared just a moment ago, you could see easily where, core where vulnerabilities in group might be. When a group is not trusting, when a group is not willing, we have lots of times when we're with groups that the group isn't willing to move. Yeah. There might be an individual in the group who's not willing to move, but at the group level, that's a group vulnerability, not just an individual vulnerability. So in group dynamics, we want to name uh, identity and vulnerability. In group discernment, we want to also name what are the spirits at work because when we're stuck in group vulnerabilities, not naming them and not working with them, then we very easily get, uh, we get uh, caught up in voices of spirits that are not of God. Uh, we start blaming, scapegoating. None of that is of God. We start becoming self-focused, um, caught up in creating systems that, that just serve ourselves rather than serve the needs of, of the world of creation. Let's, let's move. Am I, are you still with me? You're not asleep yet. Yeah, just give me a wave just so I can see some life there. Thank you. Nice to see you. We're here. Keep we're moving. Here. Let's just look at some principles. Principles of group dynamics. None of this will be a surprise to you, I'm sure. Principles of belonging. Groups are often called systems of affiliation. Affiliation is about belonging. Belonging to, uh, we might say, oh, yes, I belong to this group because I like the people. And well, that's probably true. And I want to belong to a group of people that I like. Actually, the principle of belongingness is not about the people. It's about the core values. <laughs> in a group that you're in, the principle of belongingness stresses that you all belong to the same core values. Three things that I will mention here. One is that in groups, we often, we find three different um, possible scenarios. One is that I belong to the group because I agree with their values. So I, I affiliate, I, um, I, I go along with the values of the group because for me, they're, they're things that I like. Another scenario is I belong to the group because I'm coerced into belonging to the group. I'm, uh, if, I, if I don't do what the group says, 
uh, there is punishment. There is retribution. Still core values, still belonging, but I stay in it because to, to choose to go other in another direction um, might bring punishment. Or I only stay because there are rewards. Now, neither of those two um, conforming or, um, or belonging because of reward or punishment, they're not particularly healthy basis for belongingness. Belongingness is best lived when all the members of the group interiorize the core values, that everybody holds collectively the core values and those core values are agreed upon and mutually enacted. So belongingness is something that also, when it's lived in a healthy way, is something that is best lived through interiorization of the core values rather than just conforming to the core values. I hope you understand that. Then there's the principle of perception. We really underestimate perception. Uh, we often think that the way we see reality is the, is the reality. Um, and look, in my experience of being in the general leadership team here in Rome and working in our congregation around the world, I'd have to say that in the groups that I see, there is a very often a great failure to implement the principle of perception because people see what they want to see. People see, they perceive realities according to what's happening for them rather than seeing and recognizing, perceiving realities according to objective realities. And as a result, you, we end up with groups where there might be members who feel aggrieved or members who feel somehow uh, rejected or on the edge. Well, okay, there may be some truth in that, but we know from group dynamics that what a person in a group is experienced has as much to do with them and their perception of the reality as it has to do with the rest of the group. And this is a fundamental uh, principle in group dynamics. What are we perceiving? What realities are we perceiving? How clear, how much clarity do we have in our perception of what's happening? And we know from group dynamics that the only way to really get the print, a clear principle of perception at work is when we are listening to everyone's voice. And when we're listening to everyone's voice without judgment, without cynicism, and without fear. And we'll talk about a process for doing that in a moment. The principle of conformity. Well, again, conformity is not always a good principle upon which to build groups, if, especially if conformity is... Um, is there simply because of uh, reward or punishment or coercion. The best reason for conforming with a group is that the group holds a value system which I personally aspire to and conformity that comes with freedom, not with any coercion. The principle of change I've already mentioned, so I won't go back to that again, but change is crucial. The principle of readjustment. Have you ever been with a group, particularly if it's a formal group and you're having a meeting and uh, you name, you begin to name some of the things that are happening for the group and maybe some of the decisions, some of the ideas that the group might explore to, to yeah, to what, to know what directions they want to move in. And then someone says, well, that's finished. We know what we want now. And someone says, hang on, hang on. We were only just, we were only just naming ideas. 
we still need to develop them. And the person says, no, 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 we've already agreed. That's it. So the principle of readjustment is really important because it allows us to keep adjusting, recognizing that there actually is never any conclusion. Even a decision may require adjustment. And so the principle of readjustment in groups is really, really important. Adjustments in membership, adjustments in ideas, adjustments in core values or the expression of core values, because these things are constantly moving, changing, evolving. The principles of common motives. Well, Jess mentioned that in the sharing. He said something about, I think it was Jess, said something about willingness, um, that we be there willingly and that we recognise the motivations that, that bring us to the group, that bring us to stay with the group, to contribute to the group. So how we come to common motives, common motivations out of which we act. Down in the bottom left-hand corner there, the principle of power. Whoa, that's a big one. Uh, that's a seminar on its own. Um, but I think we would need to add here just briefly that the principle of power needs to be balanced with the practice of authority. Power and authority are not the same thing. So somebody may be powerful and have no authority in a group. Have you ever been in a group where there is a dominant personality who's speaking very loudly, but actually they're not given the authority of the group to, to determine the direction of the group? Likewise, you may have all the authority, but have no power. And there are many powerless leaders who have to face many powerful forces. So in group dynamics, how power is used and perceived is very, very important. I'll stop there on that because there's so much to say about that that I, to say some of it would probably do a grave injustice. If I've got time, I'll get to that at the end. The, the, the principle of continuous process. I've already mentioned that. We are in a continuous process of adjustment. We are not in a process of, um, of compartmentalizing things where we say, this is all we need to do. We're in an evolving process. This is a new mentality. When I was talking about problem solving mindset, that's when we say, yep, problem's fixed. We're done now. You know, how many times have we solved a problem only to discover that the problem isn't solved and that it creates more problems? <laughs> it happens a lot. Uh, we, we have a difficult situation, so we, we put a... I don't know if you all have Band-Aids in your country, but we put a band, bandage on it only to discover that we haven't really dealt with the deeper wound and it festers and gets infected and spreads. So continuous process principle enables us to keep staying open to an ongoing process of attending to the deeper wound, which needs more constant continuous care, wound or issue or consideration, whatever. Um, goal, the goal-oriented principle of group dynamics is uh, quite clear, I would imagine, for you. If we don't have a goal, if we're not focused in our intentions, our energy gets dissipated, we lose interest, people drift. If you ever belong to a group where people drift away and leave the group, it's probably because the goals of the group are not clear. Sharp clarity in focus around aims, goals, objectives gives people a sharpness of meaning, of purpose. Um, uh, Jim uh, Cuskelly, the former MSC Superior General, in his little book, um, um, A New Heart and a New Spirit, 
writes about this when he talks about the change in religious life from the prior to the Second Vatican Council to the challenge of renewal that the Second Vatican Council pointed put in front of all religious congregations. And one of the things that he highlights is that when, when the uh, missionary aim and goal of a congregation became unclear, members became aimless and lost a sense of meaning. When authority wasn't so directive and telling them what they should do, members felt confused. Now, that doesn't mean we need to go back to the old way of doing it, to the pre-Vatican II way of, of perceiving uh, our reality, our goals, but it does mean that we, in the new paradigm, that we would be wanting to sharpen our sense of what we're on about, what we're doing, what our mission is, and that, will, that, will, that generates energy that, for mission for us. So a lot of words in all of that, but there are nine basic principles around um, group dynamics that I would want to share with you. Um, I'm aware that it's now, I've, we've been going for two hours, believe it or not. That's pretty um, exciting that we've stayed that long. Um, I'd like to suggest we just have a little break. So what I would like to suggest is that we leave our computers for five minutes and then come back again. Would you all be okay if we did that? If we took off our headphones or whatever, we stood up, we had a stretch and just in five minutes, come back to, don't turn your computer off, leave it on. Let, don't change any settings. Just get up, have a stretch in five minutes, come back again, okay? Uh, Chris, can yes. I just ask if you're nearby, just come back to your come back to your computer and um, put your seatbelt on, and we'll head off again. Got your cup of coffee, whatever. So, I'm just going to go back to screen share, and um, we're going to look at a model called the iceberg model. So and here on the screen, we have an image of an iceberg. I need to move uh, uh, out of the way. Okay. In uh, group dynamics, one of the things that we need to be very conscious of is the fact that the dynamics are influenced not just by what we can see, what we perceive at the top. So one of the, you remember the principle of perception and, and I was saying how important it is. One of the difficulties with perception is that what we often perceive is only what we think we can see. And there are multiple levels of unseen realities. And in older paradigms of group dynamics, we tended to look at um, behavior and we would say, oh, so-and-so is behaving this way, therefore, this is the reality. And what we know after many, many years of study, of research in psychology, sociology, and other studies is that this is actually not the case. Behavior doesn't tell us what is going on. Behavior only tells us the symptomatic reality. Symptomatic, if I have COVID, if I was sick with COVID, I would have symptoms. And those symptoms might look like the symptoms of the common cold. <laughs> sneezing, uh, flu-like symptoms. But I can only know if it's COVID if I have that horrible test, yeah? PCR test. It's the only way I will know if it's COVID or not. Otherwise, it could be a flu. It might be the cold. It might be something else. The symptoms 
point to something, but they don't tell us what actually is there. We have to test that. So what we know is that what we see is only the tip of the iceberg. If you know anything about icebergs, you know that most of the iceberg is under the water, only a small part of it's above the water. So when we think systemically, when we're talking about groups, we're talking of systems of people, like a family is a system, the family system. Uh, the, the provincial system, the congregational system, the church system, the political system. So there's the symptomatic level, what's happening, the events that we can see. But then under the water, there are patterns that we may not be seeing. For example, recently when we were dealing with... Uh, a case of um, abuse of a minor, we heard from the investigators that the abuser had, in fact, a hidden pattern of behaviour that was consistent over many years. It wasn't just one experience, one action that happened. It was a consistent series of behaviours. Now, in groups, Groups have patterns of behaviour and those patterns, if we become aware of them, tell us a lot about the nature of what's happening in the group. And the question we have to ask is, well, in the group I belong to, what are the trends, the trending patterns? What are the things that we see, not just once, but that have formed patterns over time? For example, we could look at the current situation in Ukraine and say, this is not the first country that, that has been invaded by Russia. In fact, there is a pattern of invasion that has happened. And at the systemic level, at the group's level of that political reality, this is history repeating itself over and over and over and over again. I have worked with uh, numerous congregations here in uh, Rome. And one of the things that I'm very conscious of is that we often are living out of patterns that were established early in the life of the congregation, particularly unhealthy patterns, but also healthy patterns. And we keep them alive. We keep repeating those patterns over and over. So in group dynamics, it helps us to be really aware of what are the patterns, the trending patterns over time. If we go a bit deeper under those patterns, we will find that there are structures that support those patterns. And we want to ask ourselves, well, what are those structures that are there? For example, we know that in many places in the church around the world, in relationship to sexual abuse and pedophilia, that it was the systems that were in place that no one ever talked about or explored that kept reappointing pedophile priests to new appointments. This was the system, this was the structure. If someone does something bad, you don't, you don't challenge them, you don't, um, dismiss them what you do is you give them a new appointment what does that do it just means the pattern the 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 bad behavior is going to continue in another place and that has caused uh, all sorts of problems around the church eventually resulting in the vatican releasing the statement called the vada mecum and vos estes lux mundi which state very clearly that if a bishop does that it's the bishop who will be um, punished or the, or the, what you call, major superior that will be punished, not, not only the, the, the perpetrator. So we don't realise just how much systems prop up and support group dynamics. They're very important to understand what are the systems we have in place and how they influence 
And then underneath that again are what we call paradigms of thought. Paradigms of thought or mental models. And we need to ask ourselves, what values, assumptions and belief systems shape the system that we're dealing with? What ways of thinking? So if we went back to our example of pedophilia, we could say, well, one pattern of thought, one paradigm of thought, a mental model that, that allows pedophilia to happen is, uh, well, a priest would never do anything wrong because he's a holy man. Well, we know that's not true. <laughs> I, I can tell you as a priest, I'm not a holy man. Uh, I'm a sinner and all priests are sinners. And they, one of the paradigms of thought is, oh, well, we give priests and religious some special behavior, some special, uh, sorry, some special benefits is what I mean to say, some special benefits. Why do we do that? Because we, ha we, have, a th we have this thinking that somehow they're above the rest of us. We're, we're above everyone else. This is a very, very poor paradigm of thought, mental model, but one that has per pervaded through the church for centuries. Um, and the Pope at the moment is speaking out very strongly against it. Uh, it's called clericalism. Uh, and we're only just beginning to touch the tip of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg around clericalism and dealing with that paradigm of thought and the system structures that go with it. And it's a very unhealthy paradigm of thought that needs to be expunged out of the church. So it's a very good example of what we're talking about here. If we keep going down, we get down to source. So right down the bottom here is source. And you remember that I spoke about Otto Sharma and he was talking about core values as source. So for us as MSC, priest, brothers, sisters, as daughters of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart. For us, the source that shapes so much of what we do, how we think, the system structures we have in place, the patterns of behaviour, is somehow connected to the heart of Christ. Somewhere down there, we have a source. Now, sometimes that source is pure, and other times that source gets polluted with other patterns of thought or um, unjust systems. Another really good example of this whole um, group dynamics at work is in the work of Laudato C. And if we're looking at Laudato C, what we see that Pope Francis has tried to do is introduce us to a more pure source with clearer patterns of thought and to introduce new structures that are just rather the unjust structures. What he's saying is that the current reality of climate crisis is not a climate problem. It's a problem of justice and inequ inequitable um, um, sharing of wealth. Uh, the poor get poorer, the rich get richer, the rich continue to pollute um, and with a growing middle class of people who don't say anything, the silent majority win. The silent, uh, the silent voice of the majority is the pervading reality. So if we're going to be people who are people of compassion, people of justice, people of mercy, then we have to ask ourselves about the tip of the iceberg is not enough. We have, to, we have to go beneath that and we have to begin exploring what are these other deeper realities, deeper dynamics that are influencing our group. I'm going to take us on a little journey uh, of what Otto Sharma talks about. He talks about the importance of moving through four four um, dimensions of listening so that we move from an ego-centered system to an eco-centered system. And if you remember eco, the prefix eco is about creating a domestic system, a household 
for everyone. So eco for me alone, eco for the whole, for the whole, not just the group, but remember the group is greater than the sum of its parts. Remember that, don't forget that. When we, uh, Sharma um, talks about downloading, he says the first level of listening is downloading. And in a group, we, we experience downloading because downloading is what happens when we disconnect from an open mind and we stop making space. And all we do is we listen to what our thoughts are already telling us. So I'm sitting in the group, I'm listening to the group, but in my mind, I'm saying, no, that's not true. I disagree with that. That's a stupid idea. Uh, that won't work. These are all judgments. That person never has any sensible ideas. That person's problematic. What would he know? What would she know? Uh, these, are, these, are, these go on, these judgmental thoughts that go on in our minds. In some of us, they're like nonstop, you know. <laughs> like a rat, rattling gun, just digga, 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 digga. these thoughts that are constantly judging what we're hearing. In other words, I'm closed. I'm not open to hearing. I've got a little diagram here that helps us to, uh, oh, I think I have. Oh, maybe I don't. So let me zoom through. Yes, I do. Um, there's a little diagram here. Imagine that the bowl is you. And somebody is trying to share with you what they need to share. The bowl is already full. How do you put more into a bowl that is already full? You can't. So there is little space. In downloading, there is little space to receive much from outside. Right. Uh, from outside my own interpretations and judgments. I'm already full. That's downloading, first level of listening. In fact, it's not really listening at all. I'm just looking for what confirms my own thinking. So then Sharma talks about factual listening. He says, if we open up our mind and we make some space, and you'll see that up here, if we're curious what we do is we begin to see with fresh eyes and we begin to hear the facts. We open up our mind. We open ourselves to facts. Now, again, I have a, I'm going to have to whiz through this again, obviously, because I've done it wrongly. Bad PowerPoint presentation. But uh, we go to this little image. This is the second dimension of listening in group dynamics. It's factual listening. I'm hearing the facts. I can make space in my head, in my thinking, by opening my mind to the facts that you are bringing to me, rather than assuming that my own thoughts and judgments about what you are saying are the reality. Okay. That's the second dimension of listening. But still, it's basic. I'm hearing facts, but that's about all. Okay. Okay. We go to the third dimension of listening in group dynamics, and that is empathic listening. If I open my heart with compassion and holding, in other words, if I'm able to hold you in a space of listening, not jumping up into my cynicism about you, my doubts about you, and not going back into my judgments about what you're saying, I can connect with you, the person. And at the empathic level of listening, I'm not just hearing facts, I'm hearing persons. In groups, groups that listen to the person who is speaking are very functional groups and very fruitful groups. If we are listening empathically we are not just listening to what the person says we are also hearing what the person may not be saying you remember the iceberg we're not just listening to the tip of the iceberg we're listening to the deeper levels of the iceberg which is this person listening to their patterns of thought listening to their 
systems, uh, structural systems that they're living out of, listening to their ways of thinking and, and how they see the source. In good communities where there is good communal wisdom, good communal discernment, they are empathic communities because they are listening to persons. Again, Laudato C demands that we become empathic people. And until we do, we will fail to hear the needs of the poor, the needs of the broken, and the needs of creation. Because we might be hearing facts, but we have no heart for them no heart for creation or people. So empathic listening, I have a little diagram for that too, which I'll have to zoom through this again and just go to the image. Again, so the bowl, the first bowl is me, is you. And I'm listening to you. But instead of you giving me, handing me something, I'm now holding you and what you are holding. I'm holding you and I'm holding what it is that you want to share with me. So not just the facts, but I'm also listening to you as a person. I open my heart to you as a person, to the group as a person, to the group as a whole. And I hold what you are holding without judgment or cynicism of you or the group. That's an open system, not a closed system, as I mentioned before. It's a flexible system, not a rigid system. The fourth dimension of listening, according to Sharma, is what he calls generative listening. And generative listening is when we are listening with the heart, but we are listening together, what he calls co-sensing, not just sensing me, sensing you, but that we together are co-sensing from the field. By the field, he means not just to what you're saying, but to all of the realities that are a part of the group reality, all of the hidden dynamics from the field of, for us, it would be the field of faith, the field of charism, the field of spirituality, the field of mission, the field of all the realities in, in uh, the Latino countries, they have a, a lovely word. They use the word realidad, which doesn't just mean the factual realities. It means all the depths of realities that we're listening to. When we're doing that, we hear as a group in a generative way. We become willing and we become vulnerable as a group vulnerable in a good sense, open, willing, awaiting, flexible. We begin to move away from the disconnection of fear and mistrust, and we begin to grow in fruitfulness by letting go of what we are holding on to and being open to the heart of Christ in a generative way. So again, a little image to take us there. So there is again me holding you, holding what you're holding, but all of us are held in the heart of Christ. So in generative listening, we are ceasing to talk about an ego system. We are now talking about an ecosystem because this is a communal collective reality. This is a group dynamic that is very nourishing for the group. We are willing to go to vulnerable places together, to take risks together. Why? Because we are held by the heart of Christ and that heart holds all the possibilities for anything is possible to God. When we move into this generative, willing place, we can then let come the mission. And Sharma talks about some processes of moving into a more ecosystemic way of being. He talks about crystallizing vision and intention. He talks about co-creating prototypes 
testing out possibilities, being in dialogue with the whole, linking head, heart, hand, and, enact, and enacting that. And then there's the co-performing. Remember, this is not performing. This is not about me doing something now. This is about us, us creating together, us performing together. The incarnation of the heart of Christ is not me. It's us <laughs> together, working together. And what I want to focus on as we come towards the last half an hour of our time together is how this links into spirituality of the heart. So just fading that into the background a bit. If we look at spirituality of the heart, and I've been working for some years on a process-oriented approach around spirituality of the heart, understanding that the spirituality of the heart is not simply a devotion. It is actually a profound methodology for living. It's a way of living. And it offers us, it offers us a path to follow. And this path begins with what Jim Kaskelly identified and Dennis Murphy also working on Jim's uh, uh, work, earlier work, uh, what he calls encounter. Um, I'm also aware that there, is a, there are two other models of this and I'd just like to refer to them briefly. And one is one that Merle Salazar has developed um, and, uh, and it's good to explore that. You'll find that all, all of that on the on MSC ongoing formation website, which you can access, and I'll give you the link to that at the end. But um, just to say that there are other words used for these four movements, but these are the words that, that I've picked up from Jim and Dennis. Encounter. Well, encounter is this where we just begin. We're moving from downloading to picking up the facts. We connect to the live realities, what is. We begin to appreciate the realities. Appreciating is not just acknowledging them or recognizing them. It's sitting with them and beginning to hold them and appreciate them. But we don't stay there. We encounter the heart of Christ. We encounter each other's heart. But the invitation of the heart of Christ is to go deeper. And we, we are invited into intimacy. The second movement of the spirituality of the heart is to move from the superficial levels of encounter into a deeper intimacy and that that intimacy develops the potential of our relationship with Jesus and his heart, but with one another in the group, developing the group dynamic and asking us, well, what's our vision as a group? What could be? Yeah. This is the second movement. The profound reality is that if we stay in intimacy with each other, and I mean true intimacy, which means that I will share with you my vulnerabilities. I will share with you honestly and trustfully. I will be, I will be real with you and without pretense. If I do that, it's going to challenge you and it's going to challenge me. And that means that you and I are both going to have to change. So group dynamics, if we stay with them, they demand change. And in spirituality of the heart, traditionally, we have called that the place of conversion, which comes from the heart of Christ. Conversion, which comes from being in the heart of Christ. Now, conversion in this sense isn't uh, some superficial thing. It's not like um, promises that I make at, new, at, at the coming of the new year, New Year's resolutions. Conversion here is the direct result of intimacy. It's not something I do. It's something that happens to me because I have dared, I have taken the risk to be intimate. Conversion of the heart happens because we dare to step into spaces of heart and we dare to stay there and that says, well, you must change, Chris. You can't stay the same. You can't keep looking at things this way. And you know that because when you make your annual retreat, when you do a renewal program, what does it say? 
it says, oh yeah, you're doing well, but maybe there needs to be some changes here or there, or you need to shift that attitude, or you need to think differently about this, or those behaviours aren't really healthy. Maybe you need to think about other behaviours. Hmm. Conversion. Conversion takes us down into a generative, empathic way of being. We become for others. We become bigger people, which is what I was saying at the beginning, is what group dynamics does. Groups, groups demand that we become for others. They require us to be willing and open. We can choose not to be, but we recognise that to a large degree as sin. Con conversion is about transformation or a shifting of our perspective or orientation. And it's about, it's a moral question, what should be? Sharma calls this a time of co-constructing, that together we begin to build a new world, which is what Chevalier said to us and which I quoted at the beginning, from the heart of Christ, I see a new world emerging. This isn't just a mystical reality. This is a world that we build together, but it's built on intimacy. Then we have the fourth movement of the heart, and the fourth movement of the heart is mission. And mission is not, okay, now we're changed, now we're seeing things different. What will we do? <laughs> That's actually back in the ego system again. Now, mission is what comes when we make ourselves open and vulnerable. Mission flows out of conversion. It's the natural outflowing of the spirit. It, because as soon as we've been touched by the heart of Christ, we experience perhaps joy or happiness, core values, and... Even if you put a smile on your face today, that's mission. What's our, what's our mission? Ma to make the heart of Christ known everywhere. How are you going to do that? Well, one of the best ways is a good smile, is to, is to lift people's spirits. <laughs> yeah? That's not me saying that. The, the Pope said that in his, uh, in, his uh, in, in little letter to us religious, if you remember. Yeah? Sour religious don't make good evangelizers. <laughs> so when we are touched through intimacy and we are changed, there should be, if it's genuine, there should be an outflowing of positive spirit that flows into the world. How we embody that? Well, we can find prototypes and perform that together. But we will know it's authentic in group dynamics, we will know it's authentic because the mission, the action of the group, the task of the group finds its source and its energy uh, not in decisions to do something, but from a deeper source. It's the deeper source that guides the mission. And it will be collective, not just individual. It will be the eco ego system at work not the ecosystem. Okay. Now, I've said a lot today. It's been three hours and uh, you've been amazingly courageous to sit there and allow me to do that. I oh, thank you. Um, I want to just invite you to reflect for a moment and then go back into the groups and the Reflection that I would like you to look at is simply, uh, I think it's on the next, oh, that's not it, so I'll just go back. Just looking at this image, uh, this is, this is uh, from an image from Spain. It's, it's these, these people come together in Pamplona, I believe, at the time of the running of the bulls, and they build human towers. The object is to see how many people they can get stacked up on top of one another to build a tower and the tallest tower wins but th this cannot work unless everyone is almost one organism unless they become one organism they can't build the tower now i'd like you to reflect 
What are you hearing? What's the invitation that you are hearing today in this presentation, in these reflections? What's the invitation that you are hearing to us? To us. Not for you personally. For us. What is the us? The ego, ego the, the, sorry, the ecosystem invitation. What is the group? We all belong to a group. It's a fam, Chevalier family. What's the invitation to us in all of this? Let's just take a few moments to hear that. And then I'm going to ask Ben, Ben, if you could just go back to groups again, just for 10 minutes this time. And if in your groups you could share with one another, what's the invitations that you are hearing? So let's just take two or three minutes in silence and then Ben will yep. put us into groups for 10 minutes. Okay. Same yes. groups, Ben, would be yep. okay, I think. Yep, yep. Thanks, mate. You're welcome. Uh, yeah. yeah. How do I get to that? Oh, what is it? Go out of that. That's right. Right. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Lovely to see you again. We've got we've got um, five about five or six, seven minutes left, and um, I just want to finish with uh, two things. One is a short video, and um, the other is a concluding remark. So just to go back to my PowerPoint and go to the video. And it's there, I think, current slide. No, that's wrong one. Uh, I'm just going to skip through this. I had so much. I always over-prepare. Now, I want to stop, stop you for a moment. We're going to just show you a video on what is called social mm -hmm. coherence. And social coherence is about what we've been talking about, about building socially coherent groups. And this is from an organisation called the Institute for Heart, Heart Mathematics, a group that actually studies the physical heart, but the effect that the physical heart happens has in the world. So I invite you to watch this with an open heart, open mind and open will. And get it back to the beginning again. What's happened? No audio. No. I'm sorry, Chris, I can't hear anything. No okay. audio. Okay. So some can't hear the audio. Just give me a minute, please, and I'll just check that the audio is ticked, which it's not. So we go back to it now. Hopefully the audio will work. Affected by you. Gone. Let's talk about social coherence. Can you hear? Here's you. Yes. Who are you right now? What are you thinking? How's your attitude? What are you feeling? Your emotions. Look around. Your thoughts, attitude, and emotions. They're not just here. They're also out there in an energetic field. We all radiate an electromagnetic field. It's been measured. HeartMath calls this the energetic field environment. We know people next to you are affected by your thoughts, feelings, and attitudes, and theirs affect you too. We're all connected in the energetic field. What are you feeding the field environment? Negative energy or uplifting energy? Our scientists are exploring how we're all interconnected in the energetic field environment. In one independent study, four people sat around a card table. Three of them were trained in a heart math coherence technique. Their heart coherence was measured before and during the experiments. What's coherence, you ask? Personal coherence is when your heart, 
mind, emotions, and physical systems are operating in sync and resonating in cooperative alignment. So three of the four people at the table shifted into coherence using our heart lock-in technique while the fourth person sat quietly. What do you think happened? You guessed right. The fourth person's heart coherence level went up too, just from being in that uplifting energetic field. That's the power of interconnection. This experiment was actually done 10 times involving 40 people. They got the same results and the uplifting effects were confirmed. A research study at several universities was done with people standing at the bottom of a hill, wearing backpacks. Turns out that when more weight was added to the backpacks, the people thought the hill was steeper. Even more amazing, the experiment revealed that the hill didn't seem as steep when friends stood next to each other. The closer their friendship was, the less steep they thought the hill was. The quality of our relationships affect how we perceive the world. Friends lighten our load. Social coherence is a stable, harmonious alignment of relationships that enables an efficient flow of energy and communication. Researchers say that the most successful groups and organizations operate more coherently in that positive energetic state. Now imagine the field environment that must surround athletic teams. When a California women's volleyball team heard the bench yelling, link up, link up, they interlocked arms and used the heart math's quick coherence technique. They got in sync and to their surprise, they broke their game point record. Creating a coherent social environment can lift others and bring out the best in all of us. Heart math teaches individuals, families, businesses, and public agencies many techniques to increase personal and social coherence. Social coherence is much more powerful than standard positive thinking. It can be learned with simple practices like you'll find in our new e-learning programs for children and adults. We're even developing a new technology that can measure coherence in families, meetings, teams, or any group. People around the world are receiving benefits from social coherence tools and practices. As more of us practice coherence, we can create the kind of world in which we all want to live. One of deeper caring, kindness, connection, and cooperation. Know that when we are loving or filled with gratitude, our hearts radiate a more coherent signal into the environment. So, what are you feeding the field today? What are you feeding the field today? What are you feeding the group dynamic? Are you feeding it something loving? Are you feeding it with something generous, something full of gratitude? Or are you feeling negative? Group dynamics is not just a theory. Group dynamics is about coherence or incoherence. If we live coherently within ourselves, if we live from the heart of Christ, we live coherently when our thinking about it matches how we feel, how we behave, when all of that is coherent, working together, our mission in the world is increased, is much more powerful. But if we are divided against ourselves, remember what Jesus says, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, if there is division, then... Uh, our mission is what suffers. Our mission is what suffers. So what I've attempted to do today with you lovely people is to say something about group dynamics, particularly from the point of view of our heart place, uh, from our perspective. Um, the Heart Math Institute has pride in saying, you know, we can teach you how to be people of coherence, but you know, us members of the Chevalier family, we're professionals on this. this. This should be our professional stamp. We should be the ones who are advertising heart coherence in the world in, in groups. This is our mission. This is our mission. Um, whether we teach or in parishes or whatever isn't really our mission. Our mission is coherence in the world today. And and my God, we need it in the world today, don't we? You know, you know, look what's happening in Ukraine or in other places. Gosh, we need it. 
So thank you so much for giving your heart today by being here and opening it to a generative space. May the rest of your day and the rest of your lives be spaces of generativity. Uh, and may your love be infectious to the dynamics of the groups in which you live and work. Um, and wherever you see negativity, know that it doesn't serve. It does not serve the mission. It needs to be put aside. It needs to be um, spoken to clearly and, and, and put somewhere else because it's not, it doesn't serve. Uh, I have a closing prayer and then I'm just going to hand over to uh, um, Sophie. And my closing prayer is a little quote from um, uh, here. My closing prayer is a little quote from um, the Irish author, um, John O'Donoghue. Oops, wrong one. There it is. So my sisters and brothers, uh, this is a blessing prayer. May the frames of your belonging be large enough for the dreams of your soul. May you arise each day with a voice of blessing whispering in your heart that something good is going to happen to you. May you find a harmony between your soul and your life. Amen. In the chat box, I have put a link, and this link is the link to the MSC Ongoing Formation website. A lot of what I'm saying is actually there in the weekly updates. You can read a lot of this material there, even things about HeartMath Institute and other things. Um, this is a service provided by the MSC Generalate. Um, it's uh, ongoing formation with a dash between them, dot msc-chevalier.org. If you want to go there, you can subscribe to the weekly emails that send you ongoing formation material. Um, often Core Vitae sends me material and you will find a lot of the Core Vitae material on the web that website as well. Thank you, everyone. It's been lovely being with you. I hand over to Sophie. Thank you very much, Father Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Father Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So lovely. Thank Just you let, let Sophie speak first because she's she's got some important words to yes. say on so behalf of the team. Yes, dear Chris. On behalf of the COVID team and the Chevalier family, I would like to express our gratitude to you. Thank you very much for your rich and profound presentation. Indeed, you have given us some principles of group dynamics and helped us to become aware of our own behavioral patterns. You allowed us to enter into this process in a very gentle way. We do recognize the invitation for us is to be a people of broad mind, a bigger heart, and to leave the core values in our life. Precise, you have given us some practical tips to live the way of the heart. We appreciate your time and availability in the midst of all your busy schedule. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Thank Chris. You all.